all, let me thank the organizers of this conference for the invitation to the KAIST and giving me the opportunity to give a talk here at the NICE conference. Uh, this is not my excuse, but um, my area uh, is different. My area is a kind of analysis, the partial differential equations, and it's totally very different from the algebra of combi combinatorics. But somehow it's related to the some called the quadrature formulas, as you can see in my title. Actually, quadrature surface is named after quadrature formulas. So uh, my hope is some audience here or participant here uh, notice some relation between them and then point it out the very and make the, some good collaboration. Okay, so. Uh, here's the outline of my talk. So first part, uh, I'd like to talk about some introduction, the physical background, and some historical studies. And in the second part, I will give, show you the, our main results. And maybe I have no time, but I will show somehow sketchy, some proof of the main results. Okay, so uh, let me begin the physical background. Okay, so before stating the problem, the potato Kruger problem itself, first uh, let us recall the very fundamental law of physics, which is a so called Newton's law of universal gravitation, uh, which says that if you have two particles, distinct particles with positive mass, they are attracted to each other with certain force. We call the gravity, gravitational force. And this gravity is inversely proportional to the square of distance. That's what we learn in high school, right? But here, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce more fashionable or mathematical formulation of the Newton's law here. So let mu be uh, some positive measure on our end. So the measure represents somehow the mass distribution in space. And let u sub mu to be a Newtonian potential, which is defined by uh, this formula, where uh, E is the so-called Newtonian kernel, which is defined by this, depending on the dimensions. But anyway, if you are given measure, you can always define Newtonian potential in this way, and the force, the gravitational force induced by mu is just a gradient of the potential. So in this, so from this formulation, from this formula, you can always compute the gravitational force from the given measure or given mass. Okay, so the question is how this formula is related to what we learn in high school. So I would like to mention some examples. Then I think you can understand. Okay, so here is an example. So let us take the most simplest case. Oh, sorry. The point mass. So if mu is a Dirac delta measure uh, at the origin, so it's a point mass, then by definition, the potential, Newtonian potential of mu is just nothing but E itself, the kernel E, the Newtonian kernel. And in three-dimensional case, it is just uh, x, uh, the modulus of x to the power of minus one. This is the formula. And then we compute, we can compute the force, induce the force, by taking the gradient of the potential. Then, as you see, if you just take the derivative of this function, then you can have this formula. As you see, the x over the modulus of x is uh, just a point um, unit vector. Here, the point is, the, here you have a term, the modulus of x to the power of minus square, which means, so every part, if you put a point mass at the origin, and if you stand at a point x, then you have you can feel some gravity and the gravity the gravitational force is inversely proportional the square of the distance this the modulus of x is a, just a distance so this is nothing but what we learn in high school 
Now we consider the general situation here, or what the meaning of this formula. Actually, uh, from this example, you can understand the meaning of this formula. Actually, if you just take a look at uh, this part in red, so the integral is nothing but the dividing the, or the measure into the small pieces. And the d mu y is a, a small piece of mu located at y. And the, this part is nothing but the d mu y induced potential. And you, s you can sum up all the pieces of potentials, then you can get the potential, Newtonian potential, induced by whole mu here. So now you understand the meaning of this formula from this example. <coughs> now let's, let me give you some other examples. Okay. The first, uh, let us take a measure to be the characteristic function here. So the characteristic function on omega means that omega is a domain. So which takes the value 1 on the every point in omega and uh, takes the value 0 outside. So it's a step function. And if you substitute this measure or function into this formula, uh, you can get this equation, this formula. Uh, and uh, for later purposes, uh, I would like to denote this potential induced by the uh, domain by E omega, simply the domain induced potential. And also, we can think of another example, which is the surface. So, more sophisticated term, it's called a house of the measures, but it's just a surface measure. So it's an n-1 dimensional version of measure on gamma. Gamma is a, a hypersurface. And then you can think of the potential of this measure then you can have the relationship this. So it's a, a surface integral with respect, uh, uh, with just some kind of a surface measure. Okay, he, these examples are very fundamental. First, the point mass is a zero dimensional uh, measure and the domain is a uh, n dimensional measure and the surface is n minus one dimensional measures. So these uh, measures are quite important and play a quite important role in our analysis. Okay, now we understand how we compute, how to compute the potential or how to compute the gravitational force from the given mass. And we can think of the problem, a problem, which is called the potato-kruger problem. Uh, potato is potato, but kugel is a, a ball in German. So it's potato ball problem. So let us, so the problem itself is easy to state, uh, which is these two lines, but I like to explain more. So if you put the potato in space, or a potato planet in space, this potato produces the gravitational force outside. And each particle outside is attracted to the potato with certain force. And here we, so if you know the shape of potato, you can always calculate the gravitational force from the formula in the previous slide. But here we consider an inverse problem. So, so now we don't know the shape of potato yet. But what we know is the potential, which is symmetric in this case. So we can now think of the question, which is, given a symmetric force, can you guess the shape of potato? This is our question. So in other words, if potato, unknown potato, behaves like one point mass, then can you show that the potato is spherical or not? This is our question. And actually the answer is yes, namely the only the symmetric potato or ball shaped potato produce a symmetric force and it behaves like a one point mass. But the other shape of potato cannot produce the, gra uh, the symmetric uh, gravitational force. 
this is our answer and uh, we will prove it in this one slide it's very easy so wh what we need to show is that uh, first uh, we need to check that if this ball is actually the solution to the problem namely the point mass and uh, this spherical potato produce the same gravitational force or gravitational potential then we can say that this potato uh, is, uh, the pro is behave, behaves like a one-point mass. So how do you show this? So more explicitly, we can write it down in this way. So U e is Newtonian potential, as you remember. So we want to show this identity for all x outside the, the, the ball. How do you show? This is easy. Just to remember, just to recall the mean value formula for harmonic functions. What is the character of what is the characteristic property of harmonic functions? Every harmonic function satisfies this uh, this formula called the mean value formula. Namely, the point evaluation of the harmonic function is equivalent to the the integral mean integral of the function on the ball, on the unit ball. So this, uh, so every harmonic function satisfies this formula. And then now we think of the following uh, function, E of x minus y. Here x is now fixed, x is now fixed. And then we consider this equation, so explicitly we have this function. And now we fix x and we think of this function as a function of variable y. Then, of course, this is a negative uh, exponent, so that uh, this function has singularity at x, so it um, uh, diverts at x. However, if x is outside of the ball, this can be shown that it can be shown that this is harmonic functions. So, if you apply Laplacian, this becomes zero. So, we can plug this function into this root formula to get this red one. So, in this way, we can show that, at least we can say that the ball is a solution to the problem. But the actual question is that if it's unique or not. There might be another shape of potato which produces the same gravitational potential. We didn't discuss here because it takes time, but we can say that in this case we can show that the potato must be spherical, which means we have the uniqueness in this case. But in the next slide, or in our problem, we generalize this problem. And so what we have seen here is that if P behaves like one point mass, then P is a ball. But if P behaves like two point masses, then can you guess what kind of shape of potato you can get? Or can you have a uniqueness or something like that? So we have numerous questions for the generalized potato Kruger problem. So what we discuss here is a generalized question. So for given measure mu, like two point masses or three point masses, or etc., then can you show that? Can you prove that the existence or uniqueness or some other properties of the potato omega, which behaves like the given measure mu in the sense of gravity? So namely, we are arriving at this uh, question or notion, so-called quadrature domains. For given measure mu, if omega, the domain omega satisfies this um, identity, which we have seen in the previous slide, it's a kind of generalized version of the mean value formula for harmonic functions. <coughs> then we call this omega as quadrature domains. 
Why it's quadrature? I will discuss, I will get back to this uh, later in this uh, next slide. So the physical meaning of this formula, as I have explained before, that mu, the given mass mu, so if you take the E instead of H, uh, the left hand side is nothing but the potential induced by the given measure mu and the right hand side is the domain induced potential so the physical meaning of this identity is that the given mu and the potato are gravity equivalent or behaves samely uh, in the sense of the gravity so that the potentials are equivalent in outside Okay, so we can think of another question, namely the n minus one dimensional version of the question, which is for given measure mu, uh, if the surface, the hypersurface, closed surface, satisfies this identity, then we call this surface a quadrature surface. Actually, this uh, is our objective here, and as I explained before. Uh, this identity means that the mu mass, given mass, and the surface measure on the uh, round omega uh, behaves samely in the sense of gravity, in this way. So our question is, for given measure mu, uh, can you show that if there exists a domain or a surface which have the, these properties and can you show the uniqueness of these properties in the case of the point mass uh, we can easily show the existence just to constructing uh, the explicitly construct the domain or surface and also the uniqueness problem uh, can re be reduced to the symmetric property of potato or uh, the surface so if we generalize it, for if we treat the general measure mu, these questions, existence and uniqueness, are no longer trivial at all. Okay, before we, uh, I will give you some of the previous studies on these topics. Uh, let me make some brief remark, uh, which is a relation to the quadrature formulas. If we think of the two-dimensional case, and if it's you know, uh, simply connected, and the measure is the, just a finite sum, weighted sum of Dirac masses, here W is called a weight, and Z, Z to J is called the um, node of measure, then our problem or quadrature domain, the definition is equivalent to saying that uh, we have this formula or identity for all holomorphic functions, the complex valued holomorphic functions, or which is also equivalent to the thing this way. So if we take the, uh, as a holomorphic function, if you take the z to the power k, you can have this formula, and this is a kind of quadrature formula but it's now omega is two dimensions, so it's mm, sometimes called a curvature formula, but in, this, in that case you have to think of the two-dimensional polynomials, but here we only consider one-dimensional polynomial. So it's a, a little slightly different, but anyway, we, let us call it a quadrature formula. And our formula or identity is uh, holds for all the holomorphic functions. So the degree of this quadrature formula would be the infinite. So it's a little bit different from the, what it's studied in this community. However, I should mention some remark here. Uh, okay, uh, or, or I should say something here, okay. So for the finite degree of quadrature formulas of this kind, was studied, uh, was studied by more algebraic way or more combinatoric way, and they usually consider the following questions for given or for fixed domain how to um, take, how to choose the point zj at zeta j or the weight these are the questions, the usual question however in our case we are given zeta j and wj and we want to construct omega 
because in this case we we treat the infinite degree so in this case omega has a, a lot of restrictions and then we can say that this omega is unique or something like that and there are numerous analytic studies on this uh, problem and actually we follow the, this kind of questions for uh, especially surface case so not not the domain case but the related problem we consider here okay now let's get back to our problem so our problem is that for a given measure mu uh, how to construct this potato or can you say the uniqueness or some properties blah 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 but here for domains case so we have quadrature domains and quadrature surfaces but for domains case it's more it's well investigated in the sense that there is a good condition for uniqueness of quadrature domains and also the existence so the essentially uh, for example, if you think of the Dirac masses with a finite number of Dirac masses, always uh, there exists a quadrature domain, so the potato shape, and if it's unique. So for domains problem, the problem was uh, settled down. However, for surfaces, guess there's no uh, good condition for uniqueness. Even for two Dirac masses, we cannot say that uniqueness. Actually, there is a counterexample. So, uniqueness issue is not clear for surface problem. For example, uh, for existence pro problem, as I mentioned, uh, quadrature domain was uh, solved by these people. Also, the quadrature surface problem, it is also studied by several people, and completely uh, we have a good existence theory. So we always have existence for a given measure, like for the finite number of Dirac masses. So the question is the uniqueness. I will skip the uh, kind of proof. Okay, so, the, so the, our question is the uniqueness. But it's not clear, uh, so it's better to consider continuous family here, actually. I will show you why we consider continuous family, but uh, here let me mention some result about the continuous family here. Namely, so we cannot directly go to the uniqueness problem. So let's think of the continuous family of problems. Namely, if the measure is parameterized by t, so t is like time, and you, if you take the, this kind of specific form of the uh, measures, so first you have the characteristic function on the fixed or given domains, and if you add the Dirac delta measure with weight t, and think of the uh, corresponding shape of potato omega t. Then, as you see, if t is equal to zero, the corresponding potato is nothing but omega of zero, which is a given here. But if you increase t, of course this domain is changing and moving. And actually, it's quite interesting that this quadrature domain, the movement of the quadrature domain, appears in a different physical context, in the, which is uh, fluid dynamics, which is a heat issue flow. I don't discuss about it, but it's very simply, I can explain this simply. I mean, the heat issue flow is a flow. If you pour the water on the desk, you can see the, how the domain drop of the fluid behaves. This is a so-called heat issue flow. And if you think of the family of quadrature domains or quadrature formulas, then these domains constitute a heat issue flow, actually. So two different physical phenomena coincide surprisingly here and from this point of view of course there are so many people physicists mathematicians studying the heat issue flow <laughs> so from this point of view so actually this um, coincidence um, I mean the this, the Richardson in 1972 noticed that this family of quadrature doma uh, domains behaves the same way, in the same way as the, uh, the heat issue flow, 
and he noticed this one so that the result of the heat issue flow can be translated into our result and also our result can be translated into in terms of the heat uh, free dynamics so we can communicate each other and especially the heat issue flow we can show that for example the uniqueness or something like that then this uniqueness can be applied to our problems so that we can say that uh, this family of surfaces if you have a family of quadrature domains then this kind of smoothly moving surfaces must uh, domains must be unique or we can say that so I have noticed this one so maybe this kind of the um, consideration can be applied to our questions for surfaces and then um, we uh, I'm arriving at the consideration of the, this measure this is a very un analogous um, question which is so we are given the initial surface here and then we add the Dirac masses with weight T and then think of the family of this surfaces and then what happens there's no physical thing but the actual but we arrive at some uh, mathematical geometric flow actually so which describes some um, movement of surfaces and uh, using this flow uh, we can show that the following statement this is our main result here uh, it's not uh, a clear statement but the clear statement will be postponed later so as we have seen quadrature domain is unique domain case is solved but the surface is not in general so the uniqueness is not uh, uniqueness question remains here however we can show that we have some kind of uniqueness I will explain using this picture so as I have as I have explained before if you fix the T you can have a mu of T the measure mu so for mu for the measure mu of T you might have several um, solutions the several surfaces which have which behaves uh, like the, the given measure so we don't have a uniqueness yet as I have explained however if you think of if you think of the another T and plot the surfaces quadrature surfaces again and you take the again 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 and make it the plot everything plot every surfaces and make the curve then we have a, this kind of picture finally get so these curves so every point on this curve represent the quadrature surfaces and if you fix the T measure the T then you can have two surfaces two surfaces but only one curve can go through the initial surface which is given so we so remember that we have a special measure special form of measure given surface plus Dirac masses so anyway we are given some initial surface and then think of the mu, uh, round omega t and the round omega t might be uh, several however only the one one of the surface can be connected to the initial surface in this way so in, in this way uh, we can say that this is a uh, kind of a good a candidate for quadrature surface it's, it's, it's this quadrature surface is not so in this way we can say that it is somehow unique in the sense that it's connected to the initial given surface this is kind of our result the, just, just picture but I will explain later about our result again to prove this result we will take uh, two steps the one step the first step is that first if you think of the family of surfaces which depending on the time so if you plot the the quadrature surface then it constitutes a curve then this curve is of course a family of quadrature surfaces but this 
family of surfaces has also another characterization and we call it its geometric flow and, and we can show that if you have a family of surfaces, a family of quadrature surfaces, then this family of surfaces must be a solution to the geometric flow. So these two curves must be solutions to our geometric flow. And in the next step, we show that this flow must be uniquely solvable. Which says that only so starting from the initial data, it cannot bifurcate. This curve cannot bifurcate from by the unique solvability, from the uniqueness part of the family. So these are two solutions, but they cannot intersect each other. So in this way we can say that only the one point can be connected to the initial surface. So some kind of the uniqueness can be proved in this way. Okay, now we want to state, I want to state the more detail of my, our result. First, I would like to introduce the, our geometric flow, uh, which is a little bit technical, so I just mentioned some. But the, this, describe, this equation describes the movement of the surface. And the Vn here, the left hand side, uh, represents, it stands for the, some speed, the normal speed of the surface. And this equation says that the speed in the normal direction is determined by a function p. The function p itself is ob can be obtained by solving uh, the elliptic equation. So this is an equation in a uh, partial differential equation on the this move moving domains. So if you, ha if you fix time t, you can sh solve this equation in this domain and get the solution p. And then the solution p is nothing but the speed. And then you can proceed in the next step. And then now again we can solve, we sh solve this equation to get the speed in the next step to get the speed. And then we apply it. So we can continuously make this procedure to obtain the movement of surfaces. Here, I, uh, H is a mean curvature. So I, I don't. So this uh, equation uh, doesn't have name. So, but the mean curvature appears in the coefficient term. So I uh, just uh, put the, the geometric flow or something. The name here. But anyway, this is geometric flow. Our geometric flow, but. The, why we we get this we are coming up with this geometric flow because uh, as I explained before this geometric flow has the analogous property uh, with the heat issue flow and the heat issue flow the equation of the heat issue flow can be described by this so they are pretty similar of course some parts are different and also mean curvature doesn't appear in this case. However, they are similar. So uh, actually I modify Healy show flow to construct this geometric flow. So that this geometric flow corresponds to the family of quadrature surfaces, while Healy show flow corresponds to the family of quadrature domains. And I would like to mention some uh, properties of this geometric flow very briefly because this is quite needed in the, our statement of our theorem. Anyway, from the differential uh, PD point of view, these are very simply, but the, anyway, the H here, the positive mean, uh, the mean curvature, uh, must be positive because this. this so to define this geometric flow, at least we need to have a unique solvability of these equations in every step. And to solve this equation, actually the coefficient function h, the mean curvature, must be positive. So we have to always assume the positivity of the mean curvature. And this is a requirement for our equations. And also this positivity implies that the p, the speed p, 
becomes positive. So if H is positive, then P is positive. I use it, the proof is very simple, but I will skip it. But anyway, for if we have the positivity of mean curvature, you can uh, at least define this geometric flow, and the, the speed is always positive, which means the surface must be expanding in time. And here we also introduce some uh, technical terminology, but it looks technical. It's uh, kind of the C3 plus alpha means you can, uh, the graph of the surface can be differentiated uh, three times and plus alpha. So it's a kind of differential property of the surfaces, but it has a really meaningful, uh, it has some good meaning or this is quite natural from the point of the differential equations, but we don't discuss about it. But anyway, these C3 plus alpha is quite natural, and imposing the positivity of mean curvature is also natural in these senses. And then now we state our theorem. So let let us assume that we have a family of surfaces and which are uh, some has some regularity C3 plus alpha as I explained before and has positive mean curvature then the following are equivalent first this family of surfaces is a solution to our geometric flow which we showed in the slides before and then next each surface must be the desired quadrature surface of this type, which means that um, for given measure, so given measure is like this, so initial surface plus t times the Dirac delta measure. So this says that so the, for given measure mu, that this surface uh, behaves like the given measure in the sense of gravity. So at least we can say so. so from this characterization, this theorem, the uniqueness of a family of quadrature surfaces reduced to the unique solvability of the geometric flow. So now we focus on the geometric flow, and if it's solvable, uniquely solvable, we are done. And actually we can say that this problem, the geometric, pro, uh, geometric flow, can be uniquely solvable in a certain sense. Here, but here uh, also we have uh, some techni technical terminology, H3 plus alpha, which is uh, the definition of this is that it's a completion of the, some smooth functions uh, with the topology of the C3 plus alpha. And it's called the little Hilda space. But anyway, we have a right setting here. And in this right setting, we can have the unique solvability of geometric flow and the characterization of the quadrature surfaces by the geometric flow. And using these two theorems, combining the two theorems, we can have the uniqueness of a family of quadrature surfaces. Which means that, I will explain by using the picture again. So as I explained before, even if the uniqueness doesn't fold if you just take a look at the point T. However, if you just if you look at the whole the family of surfaces, then the these are uh, these consist of the, uh, points, but the, these are cur curves. But only one curve can be connected to the initial surface. In that sense, we can say that this quadrature surface is unique. This is not the right one. This is the right one. So in some sense we can have a uniqueness. And as I explained before, the proof is simple. Oh, okay, just ignore this part. Okay, we, we want to show that these two curves cannot intersect each other. In fact, if intersects, if they intersect each other, then if you, we can take the initial surface from this point, then it means that these, as I explained by the first theorem, these are two solutions, becomes two solutions with the same initial surface. 
However, as I explained before, we have a unique solvability of the geometric flow, so this cannot happen. So this means that the two solutions exist, but this cannot happen as long as we have the mean positivity of the mean curvature. In other words, if we have this kind of bifurcation diagram, then at this point, the mean curvature must be negative somewhere. This is what uh, our result shows. So I have 10 minutes, so uh, let us go into some outline, just a sketch of the proof. So why this geometric flow is related to our quadrature surfaces, quadrature formulas? So I will just mention about uh, this part. So if we have a solution to this geometric flow, the solution to geometric flow means a family of surfaces which satisfy this equation. Then each surface must be quadrature surface. This is what the theorem says. And I will show uh, this uh, one direction of the proof in this one slide. So for thinking of the quadrature formulas, let us take, uh, let us fix some, uh, any harmonic function h and consider this quantity here, just the integral on this moving surface, and differentiate it with respect to time, this quantity. Then we can have this formula. I will explain this shortly. So if you take h to be just constant 1, then if h is constant 1, this second term does not appear. So you can, always, you can think of the, this just identity. And uh, if h is just 1, then this quantity is nothing but area of surface. And the differentiation means it takes um, the first evaluation of the surface. And if the surface and the change of the surface, ch change of the area of the surface, is a mean curvature. If you think of the Prado problem or very fundamental uh, differential geometry, you can always have this kind of thing. The minimal surface, so the area minimize. So the surface, if the surface minimizes area, then the surface must be this minimal surface. So if h is to be one, you can have this valuation must be mean curvature. So at least in this sense we can understand this formula. And if h is not a constant, you can also have a second term. But anyway, this um, formula can be proved very elementary way. And here Vn appears. Vn is the speed of the surface. And now we are in a position to use our geometric equations. This Vn is now equivalent to the P, so we can change it by P, and just to use the integral, integration by parts to the second part of this integral to get this one. This is just the integral, uh, integration by parts. Then we are done, actually. At this point, we are done. Namely, almost everything vanishes. Because if you take a look at these two first two terms by the boundary condition here on the initial surface, this uh, equation satisfies this one. The integrand kills each other by this boundary condition. So these two terms vanish, vanish. And also we have assumed that the H is harmonic. So this part also vanishes. And now minus Laplacian P. Minus Laplacian P is the Dirac mass. So the last part becomes simply H of zero. So if you compute this, we are arriving at the very simple uh, quantity H of zero. 
Actually, uh, the way of the construction of this geometric flow is just take a look at this formula. Then you can see you want to kill each other, so you set up these um, um, boundary conditions and speed, etc. That's how I constructed this geometric flow. And from this, if you integrate the both with respect to time, then you can get uh, this quadrature formula for, uh, uh, for harmonic polynomials of the infinite degree. Okay? So this is how we proved the theorem the in, in the one direction part. The other direction part is uh, kind of more technical and using more analytical tools, so I will skip it. Okay, now we go on the second theorem, which is a unique solvability of the geometric flow. How can we show the unique solvability of the geometric flow, which is more analytical part, but the idea is quite simple. I will just uh, explain just ideas. So we are now thinking of the geometric flow and the solvability. And the geometric flow means that uh, we are treating a f movement of surfaces. But it's quite difficult to uh, uh, treat such kind of the movement of surfaces. So first we reformulate the problem into um, ordinary differential equations. Namely, if you think of a function or we can always regard a function or surface as a one point in the infinite dimensional space. So that now, in, so we are treating the movement of surfaces, but now the problem can be identified with a movement of a one point in the infinite dimensional space. And the movement of the one po point or particle can be described by ODE, the ordinary differential equations. And uh, and uh, anyway, this is a uh, most general form of the ordinary differential equations, but it's infinite dimensional, so it's quite difficult to treat even now. However, if you just take a look at the linear part, so we have a nonlinear equation, which is, which is very difficult, but if you think of the approximate equation, which is a linear equation, if you, if you have a linear equation, you can always have a solution, actually, in a finite dimensional case. Or, okay, for example, if you have this equation in the one dimensional Euclidean space, you can always solve this equation by ex uh, explicitly, by taking the, uh, the exponential. Then this function becomes solution. And uh, for Euclidean space, we can do that in this way, and uh, but in infinite dimensions, uh, this operator L is differential operator or integral operator is no, no longer matrix, so we cannot uh, define the exponential in a usual way. So we need to calculate more. So we spend a lot of effort to the spectral analysis of the, this linear operator. It's not matrix, so it's kind of infinite number, infinite, com and the matrix com uh, consists of the infinite components. But if we do the spe spectral analysis, we can, show, we can somehow define uh, the exponential, and then this function uh, solves the linear equations. And the full equation, the original equations can be a th thought of as a perturbation of the linearized equations. So the linearized, so we have a good theory for treating the uh, original uh, nonlinear equations by if we know the linear equation is solvable. So in, in these three steps, by using this, by taking these three steps, we can complete uh, the unique solvability of the geometric flow. And I'll skip the uh, details here. So now this summary. 
now let me summarize our results. So uh, we introduced the geometric flow. So our objective was the uniqueness of a family of quadrature surface, quadrature formulas for surfaces. And we introduced some geometric flow to answer the question. Uh, and we, first, and uh, we take uh, one, two steps. At the first step, we characterize a family of quadrature service. surfaces can be described by a geometric flow. And in the second step, we show that this geometric flow is uniquely solvable. And with these theorems or these uh, conclusions, we show that under the geometric condition that the H is positive, the, uh, we have a cert cert certain type of the uniqueness of a family of quadrature surfaces. I think it's time to finish, so thank you for your kind attention.